presentations and discussions about record collecting. Um, I've invited um, some some of my uh, some of my record collecting pals on to present with me tonight, and we're going to talk about our our love for um, music printed on pressed on wax. But before we get going, I just want to do a little housekeeping and uh, mention to everybody that there's a chat over here, and uh, we'd love to know where you're from. Let us know where you're from. Hey, everybody, uh, the chat is over here. We've got a few people on the chat, so. Let us know where you are from. And um, Ahoy, Tokyo here. Oh, gee. I thought that said Jerry Garcia for a second. It's Jason Garcia. How's it going, Jason? And um, uh, we've, we're broadcasting out on on YouTube as well. So go over to the Pataka Zoom or uh, to the YouTube, and, and you can check us out there if you need to. I should probably, if anybody can post that, oh, should I do? I'll do that right now. Sorry, guys. Let me go ahead and grab that link and post that on our page. Okay. And posting here. Okay, good to go. So um, what is a Pachakcha session? Well, Pachakcha is the funny uh, named format for the 20 by 20 presentations, 20 images that auto advance every 20 seconds. It was started here in Tokyo uh, 17 years ago by two architects. Um, uh, Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham in Tokyo. And um, what started off as a one-off event in Tokyo in this cool underground lounge called Super Deluxe spread all around the world to now it's taken place in 1,255 cities. And um, we're so happy to be connected to all these amazing cities all, over, all around the world. It's a great way to share uh, creativity with uh, your community. So when COVID happened earlier this year, we went from having about 100 events on our calendar a month to having zero, uh, zero events on our calendar a month. So um, this was a big, uh, we had to make this big pivot and we learned, we cut our teeth using this, uh, these online webinar tools. And we're, every time we've done about 200, the, 200 of these events so far, and we've learned uh, a million different ways to do them and we're still learning. So. Um, I think by the end of this uh, this experience, we're all going to be um, super pro digital producers. And um, yeah, okay, all right, Brian, you've had enough coffee for today. Um, so we started this on September 9th, This session series. The session is supposed to be a, a, a smaller, more nimble, um, uh, theme focused uh, uh, event where we can talk with uh, the, one of the silver linings of being able to, to rather than having these events at, at our in our local communities at, at clubs and restaurants, um, we're able to connect online, and that allows us to connect uh, with uh, people that that we know from all around the world. And um, on September 9th, uh, Mark and Astrid connected with uh, Catherine Shaw in Hong Kong and F.L. Rong in, in Melbourne, I think. And they had the session on architecture and, and, uh, and invisible vernacular. That All those presentations are online, so I encourage you to check that out. Then I hosted one here called Tactile Photography, which was a good time. All those presentations are online. We had a great panel of presenters. And tonight, I've got um, three of my really great friends and I'd like to go ahead and invite them on stage. You guys, uh, if you can go ahead and start your videos and come on and say hello. Hey, hey. Hello. Well, I've got on the line here, Penny Lane uh, from Winnipeg, Manitoba in Canada. Hello, Penny Lane. Oh, Penny, I think we've mute, we've lost your audio. Hold on, we'll come back. We'll, yeah, maybe we'll circle back. Courtney, I know is in, uh, Courtney E. Smith uh, is in Dallas, Texas. I can see you're you're still got you're still just. Um, I think I saw your dogs running around. I think they must have just grabbed your slippers for you. Yes, having you some got coffee. Your coffee. I'm do, I'm doing coffee and uh, some spritzer to just nice, very nice. Depending on how it's going. Hydrated. Yeah, and um, and we've got Tatsuo Kutomi, aka Bam, DJ Bamsha, in uh, in Tokyo. Hi, Bamsha. How are you? Hi. Fine, thanks. Good. And Penny Lane, did we get you back yet? Penny Lane. Oh, Penny Lane's not here. Well, did we? Oh, uh -oh. Try. Can you hear me now? There you are. Now Thank we can you. hear you. Yay. There she is. Hi, Penny Lane. <laughs> Hi. Sorry about that. Technology. Thank you for being here. Thanks um, for having me. I don't really feel 
maybe it's not worth touching on, but I, I, let's go ahead and call it out. I actually, the reason I, I'm, I, Tatsuo is my old pal here in Tokyo. We were connected through music. Penny and Courtney, we we're just meeting basically this week. And yep. um, the, the impetus that inspired this event was, was actually the last time them show, the last time you and I went record shopping. Do you remember that there was like one, we, we spotted like one girl in the record shop. And we're like, why aren't there more girls in this record shop? Are we the only dorks who are collecting records here? Surely there's got to be like other, like who could they be? And let's have this session. And like, I just don't want it to be like four dudes talking about records. And I don't even want it to be like two dudes talking. I want to like, let's get, let's mix this properly, mix this up. And I went out and I sought out you girls. And I really sort of, I went out of my, I, I realized that we punched way far up and uh, I think you guys are going to um, you guys are going to your knowledge of of uh, not that it, not that we're keeping score, but I think I've read Penny or uh, Courtney's written an incredible book. Penny's got a radio uh, a radio show that I'm going to talk about, but you guys are so steeped in music um, and not that it's not that it makes any special concern that we're, we're like uh, the, uh, I, saw, I heard somebody call us, you guys look like you're the next ABBA, but um, I'm really happy <laughs> that, uh, nice. that we've got a diverse lineup of um, presenters here. So thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, we've got Penny Lane here in Winnipeg. Uh, Penny is, uh, um, let me actually, I don't, I forgot to, did I, I don't think I stopped sharing my screen. Let, uh, one more hello. I don't know if all of our attendees saw all you guys. So there we are. I was meant to um, stop the screen share, but I think there you go. There's, there's, there's who's with us tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and start sharing the screen. And um, let's see here. And so uh, before we get going, I just want to say to um, everybody on our, on our webinar and everybody who's watching on YouTube, to um, follow Penny Lane and Punks and Parkas at Podomatic and on Instagram at P uh, DJ Penny Lane and follow Tatsu Fukutomi on Instagram at DJ Bamsha. He, I, th I, I think he, he does his DJ sets on, um, you post them on Instagram sometimes and you also, I think you could probably get to a Spotify playlist of your, your stuff through the Instagram. Mm -hmm. And you can follow Courtney E. Smith in Dallas at, uh, at Courtney and words.com and on Instagram at the Courtney E. Smith. And there we go. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let's see here. Stop doing this. And I'm going to go ahead and spot Courtney, or excuse me, spotlight Penny Lane and myself. And I'm going to come back to you and Court, uh, to Courtney and Tatsuo here in a little bit. But I'm, but Courtney's going to be our first presenter. Excuse me. Penny Lane's going to be our first presenter. Sorry, Penny Lane. All good. So how are you? <sighs> okay, I'm I got okay. through that part. Yeah, I'm you're okay. Good. It's, yeah, it's. I, I'm very happy that to be connected to Winnipeg. I mentioned I'm yeah. I'm a quarter Canadian, which is kind of you funny. Are. My my grandfather, my grandfather is from Winnipeg, so that was another um, check plus to uh, yeah. when I when I caught you. And then, uh, um, what's it real quickly? Like it's it's everybody. It's it's a well known fact around the world that Winnipeg is as cold. As it gets, are you guys already in the deeps of depths of snow? You know what? It's been plus temperatures all week. There's no snow. It's like it's it's like I, I called it cruel irony. Like it's 2020. We can't do anything or go anywhere, and it's and beautiful, it's beautiful outside. outside. That's yeah. a shame. It does, is. Does, but does the fact that it's cold and you have to be inside all, all the time does that affect uh, uh, how you listen to music or how you do the radio show, or is it just like you're so used to it now? It's all I think you're, we're born with thicker skin here. So I, you know, when I can, I'm trekking to that radio station. Every, every week. Okay. Every week. Six well, let, me, snowflakes. Yep. let me explain a little bit about this show. It's called Punks and Parkas. It's a mm. podcast. It's the world's longest running mod radio show. It's broadcasting from University of Manitoba in Winnipeg on UMFM 101.5 on Thursday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. Um, You've been doing this show for a long time. I don't. I, I went back through the backlog of maybe twelve hours. I don't know if they go back to the beginning, but I think Captain Dan is a recent addition to your to your uh, radio show. Is that right? Yeah, I've done it oh, by myself since two thousand five, and then in the last, I think, year and a half, uh, my partner. He's a huge music fan as well, and 
it was kind of our first date was on my radio show. <laughs> so oh, he I, hasn't left since. Oh my gosh, that's that's uh, that's tricky mixing. Uh, I know. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. No, but it's good. It's it's good. Um, you also you've got a, I've re I read some blogs and you you do movie reviews, book reviews. You've interviewed a bunch of cool people. Um, you do the people have they debut their music on your show. You've got fashion reviews. I don't want to steal your thunder, but um, I really encourage everybody to dig into DJ Penny Lane and to Punks and Parkas. And I think we're going to go ahead and I'm going to unspot my unspotlight myself and hand the mic over to you. Oh boy. The pressure's on now. The pressure's on. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I'm ready to go when you are. I mean, okay, let's do we'll it. Jump in, right? And see Here how this go. goes. <laughs> All right, off you go. The 20 slides are yours. So yeah, mine, I kind of focused on um, 20 records to get me through the pandemic. And these are all records that I've gotten since the pandemic started. So uh, this Beck album, it's kind of great. It's perfect for those Monday mornings. I now with the pandemic work from home. So this is the record I put on every Monday morning to just set the mood and kind of make my day have that great vibe. So 2020 has been a bit of a dumpster fire and it's <laughs> sometimes you got to wallow in that negativeness. So when I need to do that, I go to the Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and it's always, it's my wallowing record right now. <laughs> so 2020 did teach me the value <clears throat> of being happy with the little things in life. So this has been my white whale record for ever. And I came across this digging in a bin at Vintage Vinyl this year. And it was like, it, it just taught me you got to take pleasure in those small happy moments that you get because they're kind of few. Uh, so this is not a butcher cover, <laughs> but uh, it did kind of show me that even though you're getting exactly what you look for, you're looking at, sometimes that's fine. It's okay. Um, it's probably not that bad after all to just get what you're getting. And who doesn't love the Beatles, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so sometimes when things are kind of going rough as they happen this year, all you really want is just like to call your mom. Right. Um, my mom unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but uh, Lightfoot was her favorite. So anytime I need need mom, I put on some Lightfoot and this album I was able to pick up this year, which was actually one of her favorites. So we can't take any trips this year either. We're kind of stuck at home. So, you know, if you want to <laughs> look at it in an odd way, here's the psychedelic trip I can take every Saturday, put on some Big Brother and the Holding Company, lay back and just kind of psych out, as it were, and think about uh, traveling. So also amidst the crazy pandemic, we've had a lot of social and political unrest this year. There was a Black Lives Movement up here in North America. We had the election down south, which affected us. But uh, getting this album just kind of reminded me that there's a bigger picture. This pandemic's going to be over soon, but there's other issues we need to deal with. So this year has also been something I work from home now, so I have the ability to kind of go for walks around the neighborhood. And uh, this album, Cool Stratton, amazing jazz masterpiece with a great cover. <laughs> that reminds me of just, uh, you know, put on your headphones and go for a walk around the neighborhood and enjoy the things that are around you. So Captain Dan and I became pretty fascinated with the Laurel Cannon scene this summer, and I'm really not sure why. <laughs> it's just something we got into, but uh, he went into the more singer-songwriter, and I really dug into these psychedelic artists like Frank Zappa and Love. So I was super stoked to find this album this summer. It was perfect addition to my collection. So Captain Dan and I also spend a lot of our time talking about travel. We were planning to go on a few trips this year, and they got canceled, so... This is just, you know, we're gonna go to Paris. We're gonna make it to Paris. So we put on this record and we start talking about some upcoming travel. It just gives you some hope and something to kind of look forward to uh, next year. So like me, you probably get to the point where your collection where you're out digging and you pull things that uh, you already have. <laughs> the nice thing about living with someone who also is a record collector is when he does that, I get the album. So he pulled this one, he already had it. And it was a nice gift that, uh, I got to add to my collection, which made me super happy. So the last time I saw my best friend before our uh, restrictions for the pandemic came in, we went out for coffee. We went to this bookstore that sells vinyl and I picked up this record. Her and I love, you know, good sixties rock. And it just reminds me of that last 
time I got to go out and do something with my best friend. I haven't seen her in about six months. Phytology is another record where sometimes you just need to scream and thrash and just, you know, really get your frustrations out. Pearl Jones Vitology is what I put on and it's fantastic for that. It's sometimes just really what I need. So it always feels important to trust people and try new things. So, and it's also important to value people's opinions. I picked up this record because the guy that runs Vintage Vinyl 204, my favorite stop, was raving about it. He told me it was amazing. I picked it up, I took it home. Dude was right. It is one of the best albums I've picked up this year. So the pandemic has taught me to value the little moments that you take for granted. So for me, that's like putting on this record early on a Saturday morning and just having an impromptu dance slash rap battle, which I suck at in my kitchen. It just, sometimes you need to do those little things to just lighten your mood and make the day go better. So this album and its classic punk revival just took me back to 2005 when I started my show. Um, doing punks and parkas every week during this pandemic has kind of gave me a routine and it kind of pushed me back to think about the albums I was playing when I started the show and the artists I was into and routine is important. So to be honest, for me, 2020 isn't as bad as a lot of people have said it was. I had a lot of great milestones. I moved in with my partner and uh, as a housewarming present, he actually bought me this album, which I've been looking for and wanting for the longest time. I also inherited a pet cat. So that's why you see Larry there. But so my work situations changed as has a lot of people with the pandemic. I started working from home in October. I actually got a promotion. So added stress, but this is an album I used to listen to when I started working with the company I work with. It was my go-to album every morning. And, you know, as my career pro progresses, it's nice to go back. So drop off and curbside pickup has become like a part of our lexicon now. <laughs> These are things we just do. We never did before. Uh, the first album I ever had hand delivered by somebody to my house <laughs> for a drop off was this fantastic um, score, uh, Freedom of Choice by Devo. What did we do before curbside? And final, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. It doesn't just seem the world kind of went to shit when David Bowie died in 2016. After that, everything just kind of went on this downhill trajectory. But I'm hoping, you know, things will be on the up and up. And this album is the escape from reality we often need. So that's it. Thank you so much. Nice, Penny Lane. <laughs> oh, wow. That was That's harder than I thought it would be. Right? Yeah, <laughs> Twenty yeah. seconds goes too fast or too slow. Yeah, it's 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 it takes some practice. Yeah, you did great though. You did well, thank amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, very cool. Um, I I was gonna ask you, did did you make all those? Uh, were those pictures that were um all sort of like sitting in the uh in the iPod all, or in the phone already, or did you go around and like stage them and like? select them and curate them and take them in different places i'd say half and half some okay. of them i had pictures already and i wasn't happy with them like bitches brew i wasn't uh -huh. and larry was super interested in that record usually when we throw a record on the floor he'll sit on it it's right. very bizarre it's a square it's a box right so i'm like here cat sit on the record and so i tried to curate some of them it didn't really work <laughs> Yeah. I saw a bunch of uh, titles that were in, I read in Courtney's book. Courtney, did any of those mm -hmm. slides um, jump out at you as uh, things that you have in your collection? Through this whole presentation, I was making a Spotify playlist in my mind. <laughs> oh, good, good. How about you, Bemsha? Yeah, it was really cool. I, something that caught my eye is a little bit ridiculous, but there was there was an Everclear bottle because there was a great show. There's, the the show that I really enjoyed the most was maybe a re the last week or the oh. weeks before where <laughs> yeah. you guys have your um, swooners and crooners and you've got your eggnog and you're really cutting loose. It's really a warm, yeah. warm feeling. And um, but it, when I saw that bottle of Everclear, is that is, can you st can you still get that? Is that is that like a real bottle? Is this a real thing? Yeah, I think it's a real thing, but you know what? Like I inherited a bunch of booze from my parents from their right. bar and that bottle. I remember that bottle when I was a kid. I don't think anybody's ever used it. Same here. My parents, <laughs> we had that, they had that bottle. That's why I'm commenting on it is because we slowly emptied it out and refilled it with water. <laughs> little Probably, bit. <laughs> right. Everybody did this. Oh, totally. <laughs> I'm sure half the booze I got is watered down. 
and it's my own fault so <laughs> right 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 that's funny that's coming full circle um gosh i want to uh i want to come back to some stuff we're going to have some um we're going to have some time for a little discussion at the end of these presentations there was one question from our um from our from our webinar attendees here um, Michael says, hi, Michael. He says, uh, Penny Lane, I love the weaker thans, but what are some other great Winnipeg bands to check out? Oh, there's so many. Um, one of our huge bands that are kind of making waves is called Royal Canoe. Let's talk about a Canadian name, right? A um, couple of bands I really like. My friends are in a band called Duotang, which believe it or not is drum and bass. And I'm not talking like drum and bass, an actual drum kit and a bass guitar. And that's it. And they create some of the most amazing music with just a drum and a bass it's insane maybe you can add those um, names to the chat um after yeah. well while tatsu yeah. is um presenting next please please sounds good okay well thank you we'll come back to you guys in a little bit and moving right along um i'm gonna go ahead and uh get oops no i'm gonna not gonna do that i'm gonna do this i'm gonna get um let's see here there we go and i'm gonna do this myself hey bamsha hi we're doing it yeah, we're doing it finally. We're doing it. We've been talking <laughs> about it for a year, I think, or more, yeah. maybe. I'm glad. I'm really glad. And, you know, you have been, um, I think you were the first person, like, we've been talking about this from the very, you know, we just, we've been in, in touch about this thing over the, over the course of the, of the entire COVID thing. And I remember, like, you, it was, it was kind of, you got some, your office, they had to come in and like, you know, with the Ghostbusters and they had to spray down the office and, or, or, or somebody else's in the building and it was like, somebody a else's. Scary, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as slowly, 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 like things started, like, you know, we just got accustomed to it. The first sort of outing that we had was we, you know, we had a record store run, which was really right. great. Yeah. What'd you pick up on that run? Oh, Remember? some sing right, some three singles and one LP, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm really excited about your slides, and uh, I'm excited also about the next time we can hit the record store. I'm gonna go ahead and hop off myself and hand the slides over. Are you ready? Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go. All right. Here we go. Let's do it. Bamsha, the twenty slides are yours. Okay, so when I was thinking what to talk about for this presentation of vinyl records, I recall the scene in the film High Fidelity, in which the main character reorganizes his records in autobiographical order. So I took a hint from that idea and realized that many of the records I have were introduced to me by all sorts of people. And so this is sort of like a belated thank you message to all those sweet people. Now I'll start from my dad. My dad used to play uh, these records on weekends, and that was my, and that custom of his was my first encounter with music. He played classical music and also jazz as well. The Harry Belafonte music album introduced me to Jamaican music. The Nat King Cole album introduced me to Latin music, and of course, Miles was the album that uh, that I first heard of his. But my father had a rather strange collection, you know. Uh, see, he, well, although he had that uh, rather rare record, he didn't have kind of blue at all. So it was kind of bias in a way. Right, so like I said, the Harry Belafonte, this album, which starts with Deo, you know, the Deo, and that King Cole was on um, Cole Espanol. Okay, so this is the first single that my mother bought for me. I think, it, um, I bought, we were living in Houston at the time, and this is Petula Clark's Downtown. I still have this, I still play this at uh, DJ events. And also this is the first LP that my mother bought for me. It was the Monkees. Uh, I loved their uh, TV program when I was three years old. And according to my mom, I literally cried, uh, cried and begged for her to buy this album for me at this uh, department store. And so this is, must be one of the rarest records I have. Maybe this is only a copy in Japan or maybe in, um, in the Far East Asia. Uh, it was a, a album, novelty album from a TV program uh, broadcast in uh, Houston, uh, Catadon and Seymour, right? And my mother 
uh, she didn't buy records for herself when she was young, but when she first when she got the job, she started um, screen reading the women's magazines uh, music section, and she started started buying records on her own, like Pink Floyd, uh, Paul Simon, and that Keith Jarrett record was one that she bought, and also. Uh, I used to go to a boarding school, and I, although I don't have any brothers or sisters, uh, the guys in uh, upper grades would have these all these cool albums. And one of the guys you know, gave me this tape, this Japanese uh, Inoue Yosui tape. And in uh, high school, I was in a band, and in that band, you know, the members would tell me to listen to this album, to that album. Although I didn't first, at first I might not have liked the albums, but gradually I started to get to like them. So this is what, Yellow Magic Orchestra, Talking Heads and T-Rex. And also there was a, this uh, lead guitarist in the band who also gave me this, told me about these great guys, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, and Django Reinhardt. All these you know, uh, guitar well, geniuses that you could say. They're all different, but you know, guitar genius. And also my friends also, also you know, told me about jazz. Well, my father introduced me to jazz, but my friends you know, told me much more about more deeper kind of albums like Blue Train or Out to Lunch on the Blue Note label. Or there's also a friend of mine who was into organ jazz. And also some of my friends would also uh, show me to, uh, classical music like this, you know, or uh, contemporary music like Philip Glass. Actually, uh, Glenn Gould is one of my favorite, favorite uh, musicians and his Goldberg Variations was the first album that my kids heard when they came back from the hospital when they were born. And in fast forward to uh, 2003 or four, I was on this uh, forum of Straight No Chaser, which used to be a magazine published in the UK. And the bunch of guys would tell me you know, all sorts of you know, records that I'd never heard of. Right, so you know, mostly it was jazz, but it could be soul as well, or what you would call, what, 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 uh, or which is usually called as world music as well. Uh, unfortunately, the magazine uh, went out of print, but they're printing, what, once or twice a year, maybe right now? And I have to get, uh, say a big uh, say a big thanks to Peter Barakan. You can see his book on the bottom of this uh, photo. He's a, a broadcaster from Britain, but he's based in Japan right now, and he has you know a couple of three uh, radio shows. And I have to say thanks to Martin Scorsese for making this movie, the band, the band's last waltz, which featured Muddy Waters. Johnny Mitchell and also Dr. John, whom I had never heard of, but totally blew my mind when I saw it. And another person I have to say thanks to is Jim Jermish for his films and also the music that he featured in, um, in films like Screaming Jay Hawkins, I Put a Spell on You, and also uh, Out, there, Out There in Orbit by uh, Earl Bostick. Screaming Jay Hawkins was you know, really Okay. And also my children, I have to say thanks to my children. My son is a rap musician. Uh, he has introduced me to the music of a childish uh, bambino, but my uh, daughter found this record for me when we went shopping at a record store in Shibuya and she started dancing. And also Pet Sounds, well, Paul, Mark Paul McCartney once said in an interview that he loves Pet Sounds album by the Beach Boys so much that he bought his kids, each a copy of it for education and life. He believes that everything in life is in that album. So I want you to ask you all to give music to someone during this holiday season, because it is a very important thing to do right now in these days. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, man, great message there, Ata. That is really heartwarming. That's that's great. That's such a wonderful gift, the gift of music. Yeah, that's so important. Oh my gosh, I'm so Dave Chappelle day, and he his wish he wishes that on on the the city of 
uh, Washington DC where he's from the mayor declared the, the, the whatever day he, he got the uh, the Mark Twain award for American humor he declared uh, that day uh, Dave Chappelle day and and Dave Chappelle's wish for that day is for you to um, I believe yeah for you to give the gift of, of music to somebody else which I thought is just was so great that's such a great great positive message thank you oh my gosh there's you have such great taste in music. I, I almost feel guilty. I'm like, I, I hope some of this good taste will rub off on me. I, <laughs> I feel so basic compared to you. And I, there's so much I can, so many things I can glean off you. Oh my God. Did you, um, Penny or Courtney, did, were any, did any records stand out as uh, things that you need to add to your collection? God, there's ever, like everything for me. Yeah. That Pachita Clark kidda spot for oh, me too my mom right. had that 45 and i was like oh my mom loved her too she's fantastic right so good um, how can you not agree that pet sounds is the absolute best album ever made that's the perfect perfect album to end your presentation with nice thank you thank you i just listened to it yesterday i want to um i want to add i tat we had a little chit chat but i i didn't actually get to introduce you properly but tat is our is dj bemsha with Bem from Bemsha Swing from Cleolonius Monk. And he is our Pechica, when we have these physical events and we have a couple hundred people come to our, our Pechicucha Nights in Tokyo, he's our resident DJ and has been since the super deluxe days. He's a very, um, he, he's a true DJ in that we're hearing what he, you know, he feels the room. He's got all the, he's got all the things. He's got the little thing that you put the record on so that you can walk up and everybody can, you know, see the thing. And he's every, it's just so tight. And um, and he also is part of the DJ unit. Um, Tat, say say it for me. I'm gonna mispronounce it. I just want well, Tat. You you also speak French, so no, I just not yet. Come not on yet. now. Okay, les vibrations. Okay, there you go. Right. The well, less vibrations. vibrations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good vibrations. The vibrations, and and they they play. Um, it's about it's a collective of like five, six, seven guys, yeah. and they're all ridiculously hip, and they all have the like premier record collections they're the guy I, I imagine that a couple of them have enough like coin to go to these record shops and buy the ones that i have to be like oh my god look how expensive this one is <laughs> and uh <laughs> and they put on a really great um session where they all have like what 10 to, to, what would you guys have 30 minute sets 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Yeah, these real tight mm -hmm. sets. And, um, and, and and most recently at Viva La Vie in, um, in Shibuya, which is a really cool underground bar. And I don't want to um, overlook that. Uh, he mentioned his art, his son. He's the father of Kefa, who is a recording hip hop artist in Japan. And he's part of the unit, The Killers. And I encourage you to go check out Kefa on um I, I i get why he's kefa so cool because the you know he was hearing this music in utero and um i loved hearing the songs that uh that the, when they first came home from the hospital the first album the first songs that they they heard that was really cool what would be what's it what are the first songs do you do, what are the songs that you play for your kid what are the kids playlist songs what's the what's the tune the in utero tune Penny Courtney. Hunter, yeah. It was Otis. I would play a Otis. lot of Otis Redding with the mm. headphones in the booth at UMFM around my belly. Yeah. He loved that stuff. Holy crap, he was just kicking. Yeah. Oh, I don't have any kids. I did Beautiful Boy. I remember Beautiful Boy. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, that was really special. <laughs> okay. <laughs> heartstrings, jeez. <laughs> yeah, pulling on the heartstrings. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep this. Let's keep this show moving along. Um, Thanks, Tad. We'll circle back and see if we have any more questions here at the end. And I'm going to go ahead and spotlight my new pal, Courtney here. Where'd the spotlight thing go? And I'll do a little spotlight myself. Good morning. You have your coffee? I've got coffee. Extra special thanks for waking up so early. It's seven, it's 6.30 now? It's 6.30 there, isn't it? Bless your heart. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you were willing to do this. Now, as we joked about yesterday, if you search girls record collecting on, you know, the, the Google bots, they pull you up because you've written a book called 
record collecting for girls unleashing your uh inner music nerd one album one album at a time that was written in 2013 2011 2011 is when it was published well i i went ahead and and picked it up and um it was really really fun read i couldn't put it down i joked that it was like uh it was like unplugging when I had to like hop off the call to have a quick chat for you. I felt like Keanu Reeves in that I just learned Kung Fu moment. <laughs> and um, um, you, 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 you're so prolific. You've got this, 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 so much information and knowledge in this book. You write for Salon, Refiner, Refinery29, um, Radio.com, Pitchfork, Billboard, Flavorwire, Uproxx. Um, you're uh, an expert about music and pop culture and movies, and you have um, 10 years in um, MTV history doing mm -hmm. programming on MTV and MTV2 and on the Subterranean program. And you, I read in your book that you're in, you were instrumental in the launching of Franz Ferdinand, Arctic Monkeys, The Shins, MIA, Vampire Weekend, and also possibly the EMO 2.0, so that, which was kind of fun. I don't want to take credit for the last one, but I mean, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> right, sure. No, I, I, I had mentioned that, like reading, I, I was kind of surprised to hear that the book was written ten or you know almost ten years ago because I felt like it was really still very current, and I would like to see a second edition. And uh, even though well, it I, says, yeah, go ahead. I was first of all surprised to hear that you thought it still felt current because sometimes I reread parts of it and I'm like, oh, cringe, terrible, but I'll take your word for it. I'll take the compliment. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. But I have a feeling that like it probably feels current to me because you're one of these people who just is always ahead of music. And I'm just I'm I'm sort of stuck. I'm I've I'll get to it here and I'll, I'll present last. But there was one thing that I. Yeah. Wait. I'll tell you, there's the secret. The secret to that is that it's so much easier to stay current on music when people pay you to do that, when it's your job. Right, right. But I think you've, you've uh, outlined a pretty interesting methodology for staying current that I think I'm going to end up at least, I mean, adopting. I th I'm, I'm actually curious to ask you about it in a discussion session. But um but I think there's probably all new ways that we can um, to, to learn new music. One quote that I really liked from your book was that you said, I would like, how, how, when asked about what you wanted people to take away from the, the book, you said, I would like, um, I'd like to end up feeling even closer to the music that they love. And I feel so close to the music that I love already. I, I love the notion of becoming even closer to it. So that was something I really appreciated. But I'm excited to hear about your all the all the top five uh, ideas that have came out of top fives and uh, the records that you've selected. They all look very interesting. A bunch of them I don't know. I'm not going to give give away too much, but I'm going to go ahead and unspotlight myself here, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Are you you're good to go? I'm ready. All right, let's do this. Hold on, let's hear. We got to get this. All right, over to you, Courtney. The 20 slides are yours. So today I'm here to talk to you about being a very messy, non-methodical, not committed and not good at it record collector because you don't have to be the coolest person in the room. This is where my record collection started <laughs> in the 1980s, the 1970s even, with a Fisher Price record player uh, and I listened to storybooks on it. Eventually I graduated to a bigger record player and this lovely piece is the first piece of vinyl that I saved up my allowance to buy. It took several weeks because I was eight and it cost about $15, which was an awful lot of money. And I don't have a copy of this record anymore because I wore it out. The reason that I loved Julian Lennon so much was because I loved the Beatles so much. I didn't have older brothers or sisters who were cool and taught me about cool stuff. It was all about my parents' record collection. I remember the White Album in particular being one I was told, don't touch it, <laughs> we'll help you. <laughs> And eventually I graduated to other formats. So vinyl was obviously gonna to be too expensive for me to collect as a child. And I moved on to mixtapes pretty quickly. I had this Fisher Price player where I recorded little tapes. I played tapes for myself. Uh, there was a lot of talking into tapes. 
this was one of my favorite earlies because I remember learning about Debbie Gibson and hearing she wrote her own songs and it made me realize I could write my own songs. I could do that too. Like I'm not that different than her. She's older than me, but not that much older. And these songs are good, but they're not that great. Um, so that was big inspiration for me, the idea that music was accessible. And then when I was in junior high, the disc man came out and that became what I listened to albums on. So now we're already three formats in. I didn't even talk about eight tracks, which definitely were a thing in part of my life. And I'm buying CDs at this point. I've gone from vinyl to tapes to CDs. Music is on all these formats. And in my small, small town in Texas, Hastings, was the, the store that you went to to buy records. It was the only store in town that sold records. And if they didn't have what you were looking for, you weren't gonna get it. But when I got older and moved to Dallas, this store, Bill's Records and Tapes, was the place that you went, I found. And it was run by an old guy named Bill who, when you walked up to the register with your purchase, nothing in the store had a price on it. He would look you up and down and look at what you were buying and decide if he liked it and tell you how much it was gonna cost. This Juvenalia EP by Liz Fair, I think I paid about $20 for it because he didn't like the look of me. <laughs> but I had friends that worked at his store and they told me eventually, don't buy anything there, just let us, tell us what you want, we'll go buy it for you. <laughs> so after college, I moved to New York and this is what a record store not in New York looks like. There was this guy that sold vinyl on the street in Union Square in the 2000s and that was low key, the best place to find a great deal. And we all noticed he had little stamps on his records and they were all from Princeton Record Exchange. So on a trip to New Jersey, I found Princeton Record Exchange. I found lots of albums, including this Let's Active, the very first Let's Active album, which is Mitch Easter, who was R.E.M.'s early producer. And I was really obsessed with Jangle Pop and R.E.M., but also really obsessed with a girl who loved Let's Active. And the best part of finding these records back then for me was when you'd find this little stamp on it. This is on the back of my Let's Active record. And I was wondering who owned it before me. Was it a rock critic that I really love? Was it uh, some radio DJ at Princeton? Where did this album come from? And we'd walk around for hours talking about these things. And this Elvis Costello album was one of the first gifts that a friend gave me when I bought my first record player as an adult in my 20s. And I love Elvis Costello so much also, but it was so exciting to get it and hold this again. So eventually in 2011, when Spotify came to America, obviously I signed up for an account right away. This was one of the first playlists I created. It's one of my oldest. You can see some songs from 2011 in there. And I kind of have moved on, but then there's something about the first kind of way you listen to music that pulls you back right? So I was in a record store in New York around 2014, and I, I saw this Jesse Coulter album, and it spawned an idea. I was working for CBS at the time, and we were doing these videos, and looking at her picture on it, and thinking about Julian Lennon's picture, and what it meant to me on his album, I thought, what if we got artists to hold up vinyl, and talk about the artists that inspired them, and how cool it would look? So we did that with Cheryl Crow. <laughs> now, here's where I was at in my personal record collection at this time. I'd moved across country twice from New York to LA to San Antonio back to New York. And it was time to clear out some things. I couldn't keep shipping boxes across the country if I was gonna keep moving. So I cleaned it out. I kept that Strokes record, which is why you got to see it. And I moved myself over to a digital collection, mostly. I kept the things I really loved. And I found that having the best audio equipment possible is the most important thing. I highly recommend Sonos speakers. And if you hook them up with a Bluetooth connector to your record player, the sound is amazing. You don't even have to have a great record player. So this Josephine Baker, though, I bought a record player again, I hooked it up, and this Josephine Baker record is the last purchase that I made. It was a random one I found at Half Price Books in Dallas, 
And it sounds amazing. And the, the through line is I've been listening this year to Josephine Baker, who's my intangible. And then Spotify tells me what I've been listening to on its playlist. And there's this fascinating disconnect for me of what I'm listening to in an analog world, what I'm listening to in the digital world. So for me, music is really about the memories that I associate with it. It's not about the format that I listen to it on. It's not about owning things, collecting things, accumulating things. For me, it's all a story. It's all memories. Thank you so much. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Oh my gosh, I saw, I saw so many... Um, so many records in there that I I quite I that I owned and that I love too. Um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, oh wait, what was I going to ask you? Uh, oh, what was it? Oh, what was it? I've forgotten what it was. It was something from your book. Um, how about you? How about uh, Penny Lane or Todd? Did you? What, let me try to remember what I was going to say a moment ago. What, did you guys? Oh, how much you had to pare out of your collection? Oh my gosh! So. I boxed everything up for the move from New York to LA and then to San Antonio. And I realized that the boxes were just sitting under my bed and not getting unpacked. And I was just like, at this point, Spotify exists. I don't know if it makes sense. And those are mostly CDs. So it was like eight or nine boxes of stuff. And I eventually got rid of it. Yeah. Except the things that were special editions or signed or, you know, very special to me. Oh, I remember what it was. It was it was that women, um, women, a stat I read in your book, and not to harp on this, but a stat that I read in your book was that women um, uh, account for 50% of music sales, like across the board or something like that. And um, that sort of had me surprised because I thought, well, if they're buying 50% of the music, then why are they only 1% of my record store? And um, it had me, it goes to your point right now, which is like, girl, like, I don't want to, I don't want to stick my foot and shoe in my mouth here, but like, just don't want, like guys just have this thing about collecting stupid crap and like, or maybe that's what it is. <laughs> like, I, and, I don't know. Is that, what was, what were you explaining to me yesterday? Yeah. I don't think you can break it down necessarily along gender lines. Like look at Penny Lane. She has tons and tons of records. I know. I know yeah. loads of women like that with okay. just, amazing record collections um but you have to search them out and you are able to search them out when they're men because you know those men and you talk to them i am able to find them when they're women because i know those women and i talk to them but those those people are a very small percentage of the overall population the average man and the average woman do not have an amazing record collection right Right. I think I, I think Bemsha had, had we sort of posed this question as like, who are my, you know, music collecting homies, homegirls? I think we, we probably would have, a lot of people would have stepped forward. I don't think it would have been such, it would have been crickets. I think it was the record thing. Oh, that, that's had me, that's had my, my gears turning. Yeah. I'm a big advocate for not tying yourself to a format, like may, the way that's the most convenient for you really think about the audio quality. Like it does make a big difference. Get yourself great headphones, get yourself great speakers, but access it in whatever way works for you. Right. Do you guys have, um, <laughs> this to, 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 to your point, I have my, I have, a way to listen to records. I have a stereo set up to listen to records. I have a stereo set up to listen to my computer. I have a stereo set up to like listen to my TV. And it's like, it's kind of ridiculous. It's just. Yeah, no, I have very specific setups for sure for all of those things. Like I've one for my office and one for my living room. And yeah. What about you, Penny Lane? Uh, I'm mostly digital i saw you i saw two turntables in your in your presentation two what do we have daniel how many i saw i saw the cabinet yeah we've got one two three four five oh my gosh five turntables she's got two, one in, in three the back. my boyfriend okay. collects old turntables oh that's cool okay oh, yeah. well there you go <laughs> so it's 50 50 i guess now that i'm home i'm listening to records but when i was at the office i was spotify in my earbuds all day that uh, you have you have one um 
one way of listening to one setup at your home? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Tat, Tat, Bensha, you have one setup at your home or do you have a couple? No, only one. Yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I I have a problem. Yes, thank you for making it making it me aware of it, Courtney. I I do. I admit, I'm a junkie. I'm a vinyl junkie. Hello, my name's Ryan. Um, and <laughs> speaking of which, I should probably go ahead and move this along. We're gonna. I don't know if we're gonna have much time for a chit chat after this because I think we're already near here at the end. Um, thank you, Courtney, for that great presentation. All of these presentations will be online uh, after our event on our on our uh, event page. I'll post that event page. In the chat here after we um, after I do my presentation, and um, also if, if everybody's having fun, I, ho I hope all our our, our panel our, our attendees are having fun. If you want to host an uh, uh, host one of these events yourself, um, you know, or or present or present at one or or take the challenge and and find your thing that you care about and you want to host one of these, um, get in touch with us, and we'll help you do that. Okay, all right, I'm gonna do this. Oh gosh, all right, I'm gonna, let's see here. I've made a cheat sheet for myself. All right, let's see here. Cause I'm probably just gonna, I'm gonna have to, I've done a cheat sheet, yeah. All right, let's see here. I'm getting there. I got a lot to say. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's all gonna fit in here, but let's see if it does. No, that needs to go here. Okay. All right, Brian. We're getting there. All right. All right, here we go. Tonight, I'm going to share how I got started record collecting and the ways that it's enriched my life and how it's heightened my appreciation for music and why I think everybody should consider starting a collection. But I want to paint a scene here first. This is me in about 96, 97, shortly after moving to Colorado from Oklahoma. I, I, I have some hippie tendencies, but um, I prefer something space cowboy or something else. And like any fledgling young adult, I was taking a gap year. I got my first apartment and I began furnishing it with uh, Goodwill stuff and um, making, making good use of the adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure and uh, started uh, collecting the records. And with just a, a, a a couple of 15 20 dollar purchases and subsequent upgrades i got an amp and speakers and a decent pair of headphones and all i needed next was my very first record so taking a little sidestep um, nobody really cares too much about this debate between vinyl and analog or uh, analog and digital but the fact is is that the analog wave wave is pure and smooth and vibrating instruments or voices make the grooves that the needle tracks and digital is ones and zeros that the laser on the CD player converts to values. And there are incremental losses in digital. And um, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph, uh, which is entirely mechanical. You speak into a horn that's connected to a needle, the vibration scores the turning surface, and then the turning, then turn the surface the other way and the needle picks up the sound and spits it out. And, and, a, and a modern record player is just an electrified version of that. And basically there's three kinds of record players. There's uh, direct drive, belt drive, and idler wheel, and each one has their merits. Um, but it's basically all about removing the vibration or trying to isolate the motor and making it as quiet and, and, and achieving the highest fidelity or audio uh, quality possible. So back to record collecting. Now I love the concept of an album and how an artist chooses the tracking and how the song fits in the order, like making a mixtape of their own music. And removing the song out of this contact, it, context is sort of sacrilegious unless you're desperately trying to get into Frank Zappa, in which case I recommend this album, Strictly Commercial, which was gifted to me when I was um, just starting out. And each song on that record is like a gateway to a different soundscape. And Zappa was so prolific and dissonant and, and uh, musical. He makes, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort to get his music, but once you get it, you can never unget it and it becomes an exploration um, thereafter, and you can never really get enough of it. And um, that's basically how I get from one album to the next album is to discover an album at the store, take it home, dim the lights, put on the headphones, drop the needle, listen to the bass, the music, the drumming, the lyrics, the songwriting, the influences. And you know that leads me to the next album. 
And this is what I did from the ages of about 19 to 27. And I worked at this funky little diner with a bunch of freaks who all had different uh, taste in music. And then every paycheck I went to the CD, play, the, the record store, spent all my money and lived on ramen for like two weeks until I got my next paycheck. And every other weekend or so, me and my pal, Freddie, would go up to this little uh, cabin in the woods in this town called Ward. And under dubious circumstances, we acquired the keys to this one watt radio station called Way High Radio. And we would, um, we would turn off the computer that was broadcasting and we'd, we'd pirate the pirate radio. And um, back to record stores. There's a lot of music to find at record stores, but there's also, it's also fun to do people watch and, and check out all the different characters. You can see what people are holding in their stacks. Uh, you can listen to the, what the cl store clerks are playing. You can see the electronic guys in their section and the jazz guys in their sections, but there's no rules about staying in your own lane. And everybody has their own way of, of going to, a, to digging through crates. And mine is always to go to Z for Zappa first then go W because it's right there for Tom Waits, then Brazilian, then to jazz for Monk, and then back to rock new arrivals, and then the cheap bends. And a music store can be like a shrine, I feel like. And um, when you go to a new city, you can always check out the record stores in the new city, and every city has every city has a great record store. And this is the Amoeba Records in The Hate in San Francisco, which originally was in, well, it started out of LA, but this is a really huge record store. And on one of my visits there, um, while I was just sifting through the peas, I found Fish's first record, Lawn Boy, on Absolute Go Go, just sitting there in the peas. And it was like somebody had left it there for me. I couldn't believe it. It's like a, I bought it for like 12 bucks and it's like a thousand dollar record. And sometimes that happens. And when you find that, you're like, score, I got it. And um, this was a cool record shop in New York that I walked in and uh, I said to the old guy behind the counter, do you know this song that goes, and sure enough, he pulled this 45 from 1959, um, Santo and Johnny Sleepwalk, which I just saw, it says Winnipeg on it. I, I, it's, pre, it's a Canadian American record. Um, and then another fun aspect of vinyl is like collecting color vinyl and special editions. And this is the Black Keys first record on white vinyl. And I saw them at the Boulder Theater. And you can see they, after the show, um, they got this, they signed my record, which makes it totally priceless. And this was another fun story. Um, what probably my all time favorite album, The Velvet Underground Loaded. I saw Lou Reed at the Boulder Theater. And after the show, I got him to sign this record. And it, it involved one, the friend who I with, was with taking her shirt off and saying, Lou, sign my tits, which was kind of, it's, kind of a hilarious story. But anyway, um, winding down here, another awesome thing about record collecting and, and being a super appreciator of music is sharing it with your homies. And um, these are some of my record collecting junkie friends. I don't even know all of their names, but they're people who I know from the shops and, and um, just some good pals. And um, I'm slowly expatriating my record collection back home, suitcase by suitcase back to Japan. And um, here was my, la my most recent haul. And to get a little super sentimental here, I'm going to end with Cameron Crowe's, uh, a quote from Cameron Crowe's Almost Famous. I always tell the girls, never take, it, never take it seriously. If you take it seriously, you'll never get hurt. If you never take it seriously, you never get hurt. You never get hurt. You always have fun. And if you ever get lonely, just go to the record store and visit your friends. Whew, I did it. All right. Yes. Okay, a little, a little basic, a little cheesy, a little sentimental, but um, there you go. Those were, those were my 20 slides. Those are awesome. <sighs> I think it's good to be sentimental when we talk about music, though. Like, neurologically, biologically, it affects us. The vibrations, the sounds, the tones, the way that they hit us, we have an immediate emotional connection to music. So it's not analytical. You can't be detached from it. I agree. I agree. There's something so, you know, when you get those headphones on and you, the music's inside between your ears, you know, and you've, you've dimmed the lights and you've, you're watching the strobe, you know, the red light on the strobe or whatever. You're just, you know, you've got the AirPods in or whatever, and you let that music touch you. 
and you get into that, you know, it really does seep into your soul. It, it does. It is a pretty emotional experience. One of my favorite memories of doing that is I had a friend who was trying to get her into Led Zeppelin because it, and I said, you got to put it in headphones because Led Zeppelin in headphones is the best. And searching for headphones, we didn't have any. So I took my speakers and I laid them on the floor and I'm like, lay down between those and just cranked it. <laughs> course we're both laying on the floor like do you see what I'm saying and just like zoning out my sister who I lived with walks in and she's like what the frick are you girls doing I'm like no it sounds amazing but there's something like about getting it in your head like you said like it just yeah. it makes it so much better yeah it really does. It's crazy but I recently was um I was very fortunate to be gifted a pair of uh what are they called integrated speakers which are, you know, which I think you showed this Sonos thing is kind of, but it's basically a speaker set that has half the amp in one speaker and half the amp in the other speaker, like completely different electronics, but they're, they've just basically take the amp and they put it inside the speakers and they, the, the version of the speaker, they have a, an unintegrated one, which is quite light. And it just, cause it just has the basic uh, speaker architecture in it. But, the, but, but for the, for this other one, they're quite heavy cause they're filled with, all this stuff. And the first night that I brought him home, I laid down and I did just what you, just what you described, Penny. I put one speaker on one and one on the other <laughs> and I slept there and I listened to um, Sergeant Peppers. Mm. And I swear I heard things that I never had heard before in Sergeant mm. Peppers. Yeah, mm. it was really cool. It was really cool. Everyone's gonna go home now and do this, right? <laughs> It's a new movement. Yeah. Hey, I had a question for Courtney. Um, uh, Courtney, you know, like Courtney's book is filled with these great playlists and these great recipes for, she really takes the cue from high fidelity and she it's really endearing. Tat, you have to read this book. The, I mean, it just opens up with like the top five. Well, let me, do you mind Courtney? If I, yeah, if I rattle uh -huh. a couple of these up. Okay. I'll, I'll pass it over to you guys, but she says here, if you're gonna make like a top five, all time top five, and correct me if I'm wrong here, an all time top five, uh, you must own all the albums, which is a tall order. You must own all the albums of the artist, okay? That's number one. Number two, the, the artist can't just have one album. They have to have more than one album. You have to, oh, let's see. You have to update your top five. You, you, you have to be update your top five often. They can't just stay on your top. They can't, uh, you need to update often. I know Courtney would probably never take um, Elvis Costello off her top five. And maybe I wouldn't take Lou Reed off my top five, but, um, and then did I skip one? And then you got to diversify from different decades. Mm -hmm. You can't all be nineties or all be sixties. You got to go across the decades. And this was the, this is the one, this is the punk, punk rock one. I don't think I could, I don't think I could do this. You have to be prepared to defend your list at any time. Yeah. I mean, so I think a big part of the rules of making a top five list that I made for myself um, is that you have to challenge yourself to listen to new music all the time. Like you can't just be like, well, I've found all the best artists I'm gonna find and I'm done now. So here's my, you know, top five artists of all time. Um, because you haven't listened to everything from all time. I promise you there's so much old music and there's so much new stuff coming out. And as artists make new albums, their catalog changes. Like people who were on my top five before, maybe I don't love the stuff they've put out in the last 20 years and they fell off my top five, you know, I, and that's okay. You have to challenge yourself and stay engaged with music. But mm -hmm. I, as far as defending your list, I definitely round when that book came out and in the 10 years before it came out, hung out with very aggressive music industry people and a lot of record store guys, very much of the ilk who uh, are the high fidelity guys. And you really do have to like be ready to get into the fray with some of those conversations. People will charge you um, with, you know, well, what about this album? What about this album? What about this big failure in their career? Do you stand by that too? <laughs> you know, so you really have to know your artists inside out if they're your favorite, I think, to have a conversation about it. Penny, um, you, you know, you're the mod, you're the modster. And um, <laughs> I, while I was sort of like diving, I've got my, I've got my, uh, from yesterday, I've got my 
my quadrophenia here with Bart's CD. So I've, I, I just played this record not long ago and I found this bumper sticker and I was like, oh my God, there's a Bart's CD seller bumper. And I put plopped it right on there. And, um, but I was like, this is my, I'm thinking mods is from Quadrophenia. Like it's from, it's from, but then I realized, oh, it's like mod revival. And like, that was, a, that actually wasn't mod or that wasn't the first mod. And then there's like, and I'm like, did mod ever end? But like to, um, to Courtney's, your, your, uh, your list needs to go over decades. You can be mod, right? There's how, how does like, how, what, what are the highlights of mod from, 60s, 70s, 80s. Who who do you who do you go to first for which who decade? It's so funny. Okay, so mod really started late 50s, to be honest, with kids listening to jazz. So you can start at jazz, right? And then in the mid 60s, you got like the swing in London mod scene. So you've got like the Small Faces, you've got the Who, you've got the Kinks, and then that kind of faded out. Went to the mod revival of the 70s, 80s. So you have two tone, right? So you've got all those two tone artists. That's kind of considered. I'm using air quotes, <laughs> part of the right. mod revival. The jam, there's a bunch of, you know, the Lambrettas. Um, oh, they come by. We're back and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> say again, yeah. Paul, say again. The Style Council, it's okay. a side project. Right. 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 Yeah. Good old Dude. Style Council. And then when that kind of faded out in, you know, some people will say um, uh, Britpop kind of, picked up again there's huge arguments is that a mod revival i think it is but there's a huge argument about it if you leave <laughs> but you know oasis picked up there yes but you, you're on the yes if you leave oasis out of it yes 100 percent. there you go <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of faded again and then you know we've had another huge revival when the olympics in london kicked off the whole opening ceremony had guys on scooters mod like symbolism just everywhere and it just all these new bands started picking up again. You've got bands like French Boutique from Paris who are phenomenal. Uh, the most from Sweden who are fantastic. And you've got these new people kind of, again, it's kind of mod does this, right? It goes up and down, up and down. It's kind of on a down right now, but I'm expecting in a couple of years when pop and rock music starts to come back up, I think we're gonna see another wave and see these artists that are looking back to like the early sixties rock, right? And, mm. I think the fashion will never, it was so cool. I don't think that'll ever go away. It's always, it's, it's timeless. Yeah, right? I think the, the quote is, it's, it's not fashion, it's style, right? Style doesn't go out of fashion. A oh. fashion goes out of fashion. <laughs> ah, Courtney, ha Courtney has a great line from her book. Um, coolness is effortless. If you try to be cool, you never will be. And I think those mod guys, they just, you what know. A Say, first of all but that's true about the mod guys it's no true. but it is you the second you try to be cool you know oh, oh, cool, you cool. guys who are mods in the 60s they're still doing it today right like they're always pressed hair is always nice right like oh courtney i read something a blog a, a, in your blog that you show you, you you have this great blog about blog post about um you going to an airport and arriving and arri riding an airplane in like pajamas and a like, half-made bun or something and the guys on the, all the, the, you were in the, I don't know, you were in the front of the plane and there was like, you are surrounded by mad men. And you, you said this great thing. Let me, I think I wrote it down. Hold on. Let me, I, I'm sure I did write it down. You said, uh, good night, pal. I love you, buddy. Um, I would never, I would never again be the person who won't take pride in what they're wearing for the sake of those around them which I don't know if that's part of mod. I don't know if that has anything to do with mod, but I just, I quite like that last bit for the same, not just for your own, not just, just not just to look good, but to like look, make others look good around you, which I thought was really. I think fun. somebody said, I think it was Tom Ford, maybe that um, being, being, you know, looking good is being polite to other people. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like a courtesy to those around you, right? I think it's very Canadian and I think it's also very Japanese. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't think it's an American value, unfortunately, uh, for most at least. Okay, well, um, oh, last one. Uh, Bemsha, you had, what was your Zappa album that you had in there? You had Chunga's Revenge, Hot Rats. No, no, Hot Rats. Yeah. Hot Rats, yeah. How did you, how did you come to Hot Rats? How, what's, what, yeah, the, all, Frank Zappa is such an underrated uh, guitar player. He's known for such a 
his crazy music, but he was like as visionary as Hendrix. Mm. So how did you come to that album? Well, um, the lead guitarist in our band was, you know, a Zappa freak. You know, oh, he really? Was guy, he was the guy who introduced me to Zappa, Hendrix, and also Django Reinhardt. Right. Yeah. I recently read, I have a bum finger a little bit. I had this accident when I was a kid as a finger. And, and I was reading about the the lead guitar player from ACDC, uh, ACDC? No, no, who was it? It was maybe it was ACD. Oh no no it was it was Sabbath. The Sab I, 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 Ioni what's his name? I forget what his name is, but he's a heavy. He's the, like super super famous. I should know who he is. But he got his fingers lopped off in a uh, in an accident at, at the factory uh, stamping things. And he talks about Reinhardt Django Reinhardt, who also had this accident as a kid. <laughs> Um, and he had this finger situation happening and he, and he lo always looked to Reinhardt and I studied Reinhardt in jazz class and I, and I always thought that was quite cool about him. But, but to, to back to Zappa for a second, that's cool that, cause it wasn't right, Django Reinhardt, isn't he like kind of out there? I don't really know if I have any, is, is, wasn't he, he was a gypsy, he was flamenco guy, right? A bit, uh, jazz, well, yeah, I mean, right. in, he's Spanish, right? Was he Spanish? No, no, uh, he was from Belgium, but he was from Roma or Gypsy. Okay. So okay. You know, he was in this Gypsy caravan and that caught on fire and that burned his fingers. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so I now I now I love Zappa and I I'm kind of past my Zappa, but I still put on Zappa all the time. But I we used to go to like Zappa play Zappa or what were those? There was like five Zappa bands and they were like, you know, it's like math rock kind of super. If you want to go see, it's like the same appreciation that you could have for like a symphony or something like that. But Courtney, um, I was, I read so many references in Courtney's book of musicians. I highlight, highlighted every one and there was no mention of Zappa. And I was really surprised. Um, I think we've lost her for a second, but uh, um, there's this, you know, thing about girls not liking Zappa. What do you think, Penny Lane? Do you ever, do you have any, is there any Zappa in your collection? You know, I don't have any Zappa yet, which I've been looking. I want hot rats so bad, but uh, Zappa's I've, hard, I think. I think it's 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 like Captain Beefheart, right? Like, you know it's good, but it takes some effort, digging. right? It takes some effort. Like, when I started Punks and Parkas, um, we used to get the opportunity to introduce bands for jazz festivals in the city. And my station manager came to me and he was like, the Mothers of Invention are playing. You know the Mothers of Invention. I'm like, who doesn't know the Mothers of Invention? He's right. like, no Zappa, but do you want to introduce them? I'm like, yeah. But it, it forced me to kind of, that's where I started getting into more Zappa. Because I mean, you know who Frank, you have to know who Frank Zappa is. I mean, it's Frank Zappa. <laughs> but <laughs> he's got a few, he he's got a few borderline, he, I don't want to, borderline, you know, uh, some, you know, he's got wet t-shirt, in thing in Joe's garage and but I don't I don't really think of him as sort of like he was I think of him as a certainly a feminist feminist but does Courtney did you ever did Zappa ever spend any time in your in your record collection or in your top anything there was no but there was a moment uh last year actually with this guy I was dating who the first time I went to his house I saw I had a pretty big record collection, mostly stuff from like the 60s, 70s and 80s, you know, no new vinyl, which is a good rule. I think I like that rule. And I was looking through it and he had a Zappa record. And um, one night he put it on right before we were going to part. And he's like, wait, wait, I just want you to listen to one song on this record and tell me. I'm not going to tell you what year it came out, but tell me who you think his influences were. And we have this hour long conversation about <laughs> establishing what was going on musically at that time and who could have been influencing Frank Zappa and then who he influenced in retrospect. And it was maybe the best date that I've been on in the last decade. Okay. Like, okay. It was great. I, I, was, more than that. <laughs> I was sure you, I'm, I was kind of certain I was going to, the Zappa falls because there's that line in High Fidelity where he's like, you know, um, re-released, not underlined, or you know, not not, not re-released or whatever it is. And uh, original pressing, underlined. original pressing. Okay, here's the deal. I, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna go here, but I, now I'm going to. I I joked 
to you, the the, the uh, four of you, the three of the four of us, that um, that Bemsha and I always wish we were sort of the Rob Gordon of the thing, and and uh, but really, he, I'm more like Barry, and he's more like Dick, and we're and we both sort of take turns to be Rob. And then I said to Penny and and Courtney, oh, you 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 maybe you're like the kinky wizards because they're actually like they know they've got like a really eclectic and like they're good and, and and courtney said to me we're no b plot we're no b plotters piss off and i'm like okay this is, it's on but then but now i've realized oh my god i'm i i, I, I swore i wasn't going to do this but i'm going to go well, ahead and do you've it. referenced high fidelity a lot tonight do you know there is a gender flipped reboot on hulu at I, haven't, I, I know i'm so excited i gotta see it fantastic well, the music is executive produced by Questlove, so it's a phenomenal selection and it's much more inclusive uh, race and uh, gender wise. A lot of black women artists who go totally unrecognized in high fidelity, but mm. also um, mm. it's great to see her because they keep a lot of the original lines. They don't change it. Like she oh. is a curmudgeon and a snob. She just also is a woman in her thirties. Well, he, here it is. You you guys can you guys can call me out on it, but um, this was the, this was the silly <laughs> thing that I kind of came up with. I thought Penny Lane, you probably could be um, either <laughs> Rob or what's her uh, what Marie de La Salle. Um, Bemsha, I think you're actually not mean enough to be Dick, Rob, or Barry. I think you're uh, <laughs> Lewis. I think you're the nice guy, Lewis, who buys the record. And Courtney, forgive me if I got this completely wrong, but you're either the 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 the, the flirty um, girl who comes in with the the mixed taper, or you're the radio critic, the the music critic from from uh, Almost Perfect. And I and as much as I might wish I could be Barry, I'm more like the the Captain Beefheart guy or the guy that doesn't have uh, blonde on blonde, <laughs> which is kind of like that was a harsh realization, but. Um, I don't have blonde on blonde either. It's okay. <laughs> uh, actually, I do have blonde on blonde, so <laughs> that's a little, a little redemption. Okay. Have you seen blonde on blonde? No. Oh crap, we're out here. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that was so much fun, guys. Do we have any? Are, are there any outstanding questions here in the in the panel? I think we're kind of run out of time. We've gone over here. Tony Iommi was the guy, uh, um, and that was thanks for Mar. Mar Macarena. Macarena. So um, I want to thank, let's see, I do have a few last slides here to, to show our, let's see, where do we go? Um, oh my gosh, it went all the way back to the beginning. Um, I just want to zip through these real quick. I think that's uh, Wines Our Evening down here. Um, thank you guys so much. This was such a blast. I really, really am grateful for your involvement. And I know it was a super early rise for you guys. And um, I really can't thank you enough. Come on, let's play this guys. Please, what are you doing? Okay, so um, I want to encourage everybody to go check out Punks and Parkas. Uh, it's a great podcast, fifth longest running podcast and uh, longest running podcast in the world. And uh, go check out Bemsha Swing on Instagram and find his Spotify playlists. Um, Courtney is over at uh, Courtney E. Smith. Oh, no, wait, Courtney and writing. Tell me what it is, Courtney. I've Courtney come words. <laughs> Courtneyandwords.com. Thank you. There is so much. I can't even, I can't say enough. There's so much content that she's written. She's an amazing writer and go get her book, get her old one. It's not just record collecting for girls. It's record collecting for anybody and all of her stuff that she's been publishing over the last year. I, I'm excited to dig in from now. I'm over at brianscottpeterson.com. You can check out some of my photo stuff. I do photos. And um, that's our session. And uh, thanks for joining us. And if you want to get involved, send us an email or check out these presentations. They'll be online here at, at pachakta.com in, uh, in a couple of days. Thank you guys so much. I want to commemorate the, uh, the evening with a little screenshot of us saying hello, goodbye to everyone. Oh, oops, hold on. Let me close that. Give me your best smile here in three, two, and look at your camera. Three, two, one. Okay, and thank you to all our web panelists and everybody who is tuning in on YouTube. Guys, thank you so much. It was so much fun. We'll yeah. see you around. Yeah.
Thanks Bye, for Tad. Thank Bye, you. thanks for coming. Bye, Penny Lane. I can't wait to hear the next show. Courtney, good luck. Stay in touch. Bye. <laughs>